please open your Bible to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. We're beginning a series called Adventus. That's a Latin term. It comes from ancient Roman times, and Adventus in Latin means arrival. And it was the ceremony par excellence. That's what I read this past week. Ceremony par excellence. It was this grand ceremony that would take place whenever some, some important arrival would happen. So sometimes that would be the birth of an heir, a prince or a son in Roman times. They're born and there's this Adventist celebration. The, the heir has arrived. Uh, other times is um, if an emperor was entering in, they've traveled their domain and they're entering into a city that is part of their empire, the city would welcome that king, that emperor, with an Adventist celebration. There would be parades and horns and flags and celebrating uh, cheering. It was the arrival of the king. And this term Adventus is where we get our term Advent. The weeks leading up to Christmas, we are anticipating the arrival of our king, Jesus. And so this series, the, the next few weeks, as we reflect on Jesus's coming, his first Advent, Many times when we're speaking of Advent, we think of it in two main ways. Jesus' first coming, but also his second coming, his return. He will come again, and he will have a second Advent, a second arrival. And so this year, as we think about Advent and the Adventus of Christ, the arrival of Christ, we're going to look at how he is the heir. He is the king who is the son of royal blood. What do I mean by that? If you've ever watched Lord of the Rings uh, that, or read the trilogy Lord of the Rings, there's a character in there by the name of Aragorn. Aragorn is a ranger. He's this nobody that's, you know, he just kind of roams around and he rides on his horse and he's dirty and, you know, scruffy and all this. But it turns out that this Aragorn is actually the heir of of an ancient royal bloodline. He's the heir, the son of Isildur, king of Gondor. And Aragorn is the royal heir. He is the rightful king to the throne. And so the last of those movies and books in that series is called Return of the King because the king is coming back to conquer his enemy and take the throne. And that's what we get in the story of Jesus. He is the returning king. He came once in the first advent, but he's also coming again. He's going to return as king of creation. And so what we're going to look at over the next four Sundays or five Sundays leading up to Christmas is four topics, how Jesus is the rightful heir, the rightful son. So today we're going to see Jesus is the son of Adam which means he is truly man. That's what we'll look at this morning. And as the perfect God-man, he is our king and worthy of our worship and honor. Next week, we'll look at Jesus being the son of David and what that means. And then we'll look at how he is the son of man and how that's different from the son of Adam. What all is included in that phrase, son of man? That was Jesus' own favorite description of himself his own title that he used more often than any other, the Son of Man. And then we'll look at how he is the Son of God on Christmas Day. Yes, we will gather for worship on Christmas Day. So uh, Christmas is on a Sunday this year, uh, so hopefully we will be able to see some of your cheery faces that morning for worship. So that's what the next several weeks are going to look like. And so this morning as we come to Romans chapter 5, you might not think of this right off the bat as being a Christmas passage, but we're going to see what it means that Jesus is the truly perfect man and Savior of mankind. Jesus is the truly perfect man and Savior of mankind. Would you follow along with me, Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 12. 
Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men or all mankind, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if Because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as... By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, as we come to this text, our lives are burdened by sin, our own personal sin, but we also feel the brokenness, the pain, the results of others' sins, the repercussion that has for our own lives and the lives of our loved ones, our friends, our family. Lord, I pray that this morning you would show us the hope of Christmas, the joy of Christmas, that there is a better man, a better man than Adam, and a better man than any one of us. And through that good and perfect man, we can have salvation by grace through faith. pray that you would show us that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your worship guide, you can look on the back. It's uh, provided an outline there for you. What we're going to see this morning from this passage is that Jesus is first truly man. He's a real man. Second, that he is a perfect man, the perfect man. And third, that he is the savior of mankind. Um, Now, I'm using the terms men, mankind, Um, even though that's not politically correct these days, you're supposed to say humans and things like that. Um, but this is the language of the Bible that we're using. The term that you have come up in this passage is from the Greek word anthropos. It's where we get our term anthropology, the study of mankind. Um, and so anthropos can be translated as man, singular, or mankind as a whole, the, the race of mankind or humans. And so if I you know, use different terms throughout the sermon, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm playing with that word there, anthropos. So the first thing we see that I want you to see from this passage is that Jesus is truly man. He really is man. This is the, the language that we get in our ancient church creeds, that he is truly man and truly God. This is what Christmas celebrates. It celebrates that God, the second person of the Trinity, Christ, was born. That's what we just saying. He was born in the flesh. He took on human nature and yet was without sin. And in this passage in verse 14, that's what 
it turns out the whole story of the scriptures, the whole plan of God's salvation was actually intended for that. Verse 14 says, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. That, that phrase type, that word type, um, means it's like a symbolic type of person. When we use that term, Adam was a type of Christ, or Joseph in the Old Testament was a type of Christ, or David as a shepherd was a type of Christ. What that means is they were real people, but they were uh, figures in history who were pointing us forward to who Jesus would be and how Jesus would be the perfect fulfillment of those men in the Old Testament. And so going all the way back to creation, Adam was actually created by God as a type of Christ. What does that mean? It means that Jesus was not the backup plan. Jesus was the plan. That before the foundations of the world, God knew how he would save his people from their sins. This, this was part of God's foreknowledge and plan from before he ever, ever even created the world. He had planned to save people, his people, from their sins through Jesus Christ. And so Adam, though he created Adam perfectly, he knew Adam would sin. And that opens a whole box of questions, doesn't it, that we can't really get into all the details of that this morning. But God really did intend to create Adam, knowing Adam would sin, but also knowing that Adam was a type, a symbolic pointing forward to who Jesus would be as the perfect, true man that would save his people from their sins. Adam was a type of the one who was to come. Jesus, in this passage, is described as an anthropos, a man. That it is through this man, look at verse 17, um, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, that's talking about Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Anthropos, Jesus Christ. So this passage is saying Jesus was a man, a true man, not, not this God who took on the appearance of a man, but who truly became man. He was born into this world as a baby, conceived of by the Holy Spirit, but born of the Virgin Mary. Perfect God, holy God, truly God, and truly perfect man. Luke chapter 3 um, lists a genealogy of Christ. You get a genealogy also in Matthew chapter 1. I'll talk about that next week. But in Luke chapter 3, it traces uh, Jesus' ancestors all the way back to Adam. What, what's the point of that? The point of that is to say Jesus really did descend from Adam. He really is a man in the lineage of Adam who has come to complete and perfect and save and redeem what Adam failed to do for all of mankind. And so Jesus is the perfect son of Adam. Galatians 4.4 4 says at just the right time, when the fullness of time had come, Jesus was born of a woman. He really was born. He, he really did incubate inside of a woman's womb for nine months before he was born. I don't know if I should use that term, incubate. But, um, but, but that's the point. Jesus was a real embryo. He was a real baby in a womb who was born through the birth canal. I mean, this really happened. And so this Jesus was born a human, a man. He was a true man. And why did that have to happen? Well, it had to happen because he had to complete and redeem and fulfill what the first Adam failed to do. We read that earlier during our time of confession, how Adam, through Adam, death entered the world. And so through Christ, the second and better Adam, life can enter in through his resurrection because he's conquered death 
on our behalf. That's why it says we will reign in life at the end of verse 17 through this one man, Jesus Christ. We will be victorious over death through faith in Christ because he is the true and better Adam. Now, in Titus 3, verses 4 through 7, it says this, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Now, why do I quote this verse? Because that's talking about Jesus. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, it appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. God's love and goodness appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. And he saved us, verse 5, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see, Jesus is the rightful heir, but through faith in him, we become co-heirs with Christ. But the first part of that is what I want to focus on. I'm not preaching Titus 3. I've already done that before. But in verse 4 of Titus 3, there's this phrase that comes up. And in our translation, it says, loving kindness. And that Greek word only appears in the New Testament two times. And I'm not usually harping on the Greek, but this is, this is, a really, this is one to focus on. That Greek word is ph philanthropia. Does that sound familiar? You ever heard the term philanthrop philanthropy or philanthropist? It, that usually describes someone who is kind to the other humans, someone who goes on a humanitarian project, is really generous, helps people in need. Well, that term philanthropia is a verb used to describe God's nature in this verse. And that word, philanthropia, comes from two Greek root words. The first is philio, which means friend or lover. Not lover in the, in the romantic way, but someone who loves. And then anthropos, which we've already talked about, man or mankind. And so philanthropia, someone who is a philanthropia, is someone who is a friend or one who loves humans, one who loves mankind. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of, of history lesson for you. This is fun stuff. I don't know if you ever in school studied Greek gods, Roman gods, and Greek culture and all that kind of stuff. My daughters have actually learned some of this already. Um, and maybe you high schoolers are out there, you went through this stuff and you thought this would never have any relevance to you. Well, here's the relevance, okay? I'm going to give it to you. In Greek culture, they had a, a, a pantheon of gods, right? All these different gods for different things. And the head god was Zeus. But then you also had these other gods. And then you also had titans, which were like, I guess, uh, you know, um, Aaron boys of the gods. I don't know. They were strong beings too. And so there's two specific people, well, two specific fictional characters I want to focus on here. The first is a, guy, a titan by the name of Prometheus. They're, they made a, a, a movie about him, Prometheus. Um, and then there's another god, Hermes. He was like the messenger god of, of Zeus. These two gods in one ancient Greek uh, text, um, you know, before the time of the New Testament, these two, this Titan and this God, were both um, charged with crimes and condemned to punishment by Zeus and the other gods because of their love and care and compassion for humans. And the word used when they're given their charges is philanthropia in these ancient Greek texts. You see, the, the Greeks couldn't imagine a God who would actually love human beings, who would love mankind. Men were just supposed to be their servants, the ones who worshipped and, and boosted their ego. And so t this Titan and this God, Prometheus and Hermes, were actually condemned to punishment by the other gods because of their philanthropia. 
Now, 300, 400 years later, you get the New Testament, and Paul, when he's trying to think of how am I going to describe the love of God to these pagan Greek people on the island of Crete, oh yeah, our God is a philanthropia. He's a God who loves humans. Isn't that cool? He loves humans so much that he became one. He took on their nature so that he could know them, be with them, identify with them, live with them. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The incarnation coming from a, a, another two Greek roots, in meaning into, carne meaning flesh, the incarnation is Jesus coming into the flesh. He took on our nature. And he really became man. Why? Because he loves us. And he came to save us. We have a God who loves humans. Because he made them in his image. And in order to save and redeem them, he came into our world to love us, to identify with us, and to save us. So... Jesus was truly man. But then we also see that Jesus was the perfect man. Look at verses 18 and 19. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. This is talking about Jesus' active obedience. His active obedience. When he came on earth, he didn't just set up camp in his bedroom and avoid sin. Okay? <laughs> um, he actually lived a righteous life. He acted in obedience to God. He did good and perfect things. And what that is, is he's racking up a record of righteousness and obedience. He's earning righteousness and obedience according to the law of God on our behalf. So then when Jesus goes to the cross and he's nailed to the cross, when it says he took our sins on the cross, that is one aspect of, of salvation. His substitutionary atonement. He took our place. He became a substitute for us as a perfect human being, he took our sin. But then 2 Corinthians 5.21 says something else took place. There was an exchange that took place. He took our sin and he gave us his perfect record of righteousness. And this happens by faith. That's what justification is. So all these terms that you get about the grace, uh, the grace of God through the righteousness that comes by faith, through the justification that comes by grace, this is what's taking place by faith in Christ. He takes all of our sin on the cross, and he gives us, credits to us, his perfect record of righteousness. That's his active obedience, that he actively obeyed God for 33 years. Why did he do that? Because that's what is required of every single one of us. But we can't do that. Jesus, God, the judge, requires perfection. If you want to enter into his heaven, it requires a perfect record of righteousness. To offer to God and say, here's my pass. But we don't have that on our own. We need that given to us. And that's what Jesus offers us in the gospel. His perfect record of righteousness. So he takes our sin and he gives us by justification his righteousness. There was a, a pastor and theologian by the name of J. Gresham Machen. He was a pastor in Philadelphia. He actually um, defended the faith, uh, defended the teaching of the Bible of um, the inspiration of Scripture and the inerrancy of Scripture, which means the Bible is without error. It is the wor very Word of God, fully reliable, fully trustworthy. We're doing a lot of theology today. Isn't this fun? Um, so Machen was one of those guys. He was a pastor. He was a th theologian. He was a defender of the faith. 
had all, you know, this long record of things um, to, to boost himself up in if he wanted to, right? To find a sense of pride in. Well, he was off on a trip when he was 55 years old. He was on a trip. He had been asked to preach um, at this conference or retreat or whatever, and he came down with pneumonia because of the weather. I think it was in Utah. Um, he came down with pneumonia, and it became very apparent that he wasn't going to survive. So he actually sent a letter to his fellow professor and friend in Philadelphia, John Murray, and it was, it was a telegram, so it was very short. He said, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. He was resting in the righteousness of Christ for him. Not in his own good works, not in all the achievements that he had done for Christ, but in what Christ had done for him. He had perfectly obeyed the law of God on his behalf, And he was crediting that righteousness to him by faith. So thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. Is that your story this morning? Do you know that without Jesus fulfilling the law for you, becoming a man, representing you perfectly, and dying on the cross for your sins, that there's no hope without that? That that is the very hope of Christmas? Which leads us to our last point, that Jesus is the Savior of mankind. Look at verses 15 through 17 again. You see this phrase pop up over and over and over. The free gift, the free gift, the free gift. This is why I believe this is a Christmas passage. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. This is the story of Christmas, that God loved us enough to give us something. What was that gift? It was his own son. The free gift of God's son to us, the free gift of his son's righteousness to us, the free gift of his life to us, and eternal life with him forever. Grace and justification and righteousness and salvation for all who believe. You see, Jesus actually said that this salvation, the gospel, is the reason he came to earth. So when you look at Jesus' manger, the cradle, you also have to think about the cross. That's why he was born. He was born, we sang it already, to die. You see, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's for anyone who believes. It's a free gift, a free offer of good news to all who would believe. Throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus says several phrases about the reason he came. He didn't come just to do a good work of humanitarian relief, right? He wasn't merely a philanthropist. Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. I came not for the righteous, but for sinners. I came to serve and not be served and to give my life as a ransom for many. And then 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul, when he's laying out the gospel to Timothy, this young pastor, he says, Jesus Christ came into the world. That's Christmas, right? Why did he come into the world? To save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The reason for Christmas is salvation for sinners who believe. This this passage says that it's through this one man, Jesus Christ, 
that all who believe in him, all who follow him through faith and repentance will be victorious in the end, will reign through life in the end. 1 Corinthians 15, which we read through our confession, talked also about this victory that is through this one man, Jesus Christ. And it reminded me, I serve, um, throughout the football season, I serve with Batesburg-Leesville, the football team here. And I'm not going to lay out the details of this specific game because it was painful. But we were playing a team, um, and they were, they were okay. You know, we were probably a better overall team, but they had this one player, number two. And that's who, the, that's who the coaches talked about before the game. They said, if we stop number two, we're going to win. They talked about him during the game. We got to stop number two. And then after we lost the game, they talked about him at the end of the game. We were winning. And then here comes number two. The rest of the team just riding on his back. There goes number two. And I'm pretty sure number two scored all of their points that game on defense and offense. And the, the rest of the team was victorious, but they were victorious because of number two. And the coach even said, the baseball coach even said, they were just riding on his back the whole game. And it reminded me of Jesus. We get to claim the victory, but not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. He's our number two. He's our number one. Right? And we're just riding on his coattails. We get to watch him ride, run into victory, and we get to follow after him into heaven, rejoicing that we are more than conquerors through Christ, not through ourselves, but through the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So what does Romans 5 show us about Christmas? It shows us that Christmas is a rescue mission. It's Jesus entering into enemy territory to bring his people out. It's him coming into our world to save us. That Christmas is not about just a cradle, but it's about a cross and it's about a crown. That Jesus is our Savior King, the Savior of mankind, who was truly man, who was perfect man, and who saves all mankind who believe in him. That's the good news of Christmas. Jesus came into our world to save sinners. Are you a sinner? Jesus came for you. And Jesus came for me. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for the incarnation. We thank you for your love of human beings that you have made in your own image and that you did not leave alone, but you came into our world. You took on flesh. You came to live among us. And as a perfect human being, and as the perfect God, fully God and fully man, you offered your life on the cross for us, for sinners, so that anyone who believes our sins are nailed to the cross and your perfect righteousness, your active obedience, that record that you earned is credited to us. There's no hope without Christmas. We thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to lower yourself to the state of humanity, that you are a God who loves and cares for humans enough to become one of them, who is still one of us, and who is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, waiting for all of your people to enter into glory with you again one day. We look forward to that day, your second advent. We pray that during this Christmas season, we would reflect on all those truths. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>